Thank you very much, Dr. Gitnick. Um, so uh, thank you all for all coming here for day two of the Mellenkoff Symposium. So, uh, you know, it's raining outside, which means it's a really good time to learn some IBD. Uh, so uh, today, my, my name is Jenny Sock, and I'll be moderating the next section uh, for, uh, for the Mellenkoff Symposium, the IBD session. And we're very lucky to have three experts in the field of IBD here today to give us their perspectives on different clinical challenges. So I'm going to take a few moments to introduce them to you today. So uh, first, we have Dr. David Schwartz. He's the professor of medicine as well as the director of the Crohn's and Colitis Center at Vanderbilt University. He's one of our foremost thought experts. And um, especially in perianal Crohn's disease, we're very lucky to have him here today for to discuss some of our most challenging cases. So we have Dr. Maria Abreu. She's a professor of medicine as well as professor of microbiology and immunology, as well as the director of the Crohn's and Colitis Center at the University of Miami, as well as our former president of the EGA. Uh, she um, is a physician scientist, and her perspectives on uh, basic science perspectives brought into clinical care has really helped us advance our, uh, our clinical care. So um, her research has spanned everything from microbe host interactions to uh, genotype phenotype interactions in, in patients with IBD, especially the Hispanic population, and determining more clinical predictors of treatment response. So we're really lucky to have her here today. And then last but not least, we have Dr. Daniel Hummus, who's the professor of medicine at UCLA. And his research has really focused, has been, uh, he's had a very prolific career. Uh, his uh, earlier work has worked in uh, mesenchymal uh, stromal cell, um, can, uh, stromal cell uh, treatments in Crohn's disease and um, has now spanned to improving quality of care in IBD and as well as other chronic illnesses. So we're also very lucky to have his perspectives on our cases today. So over the next two hours, we're going to be presenting three cases, one in ulcerative colitis as well as two in Crohn's disease. And the cases will be um, a mix of, uh, we'll have panel discussions as well as audience participation and many lectures from our experts. So with the audience participation questions, there's not going to be a right answer a lot of times. So don't feel shy. It's okay. We want to see what everyone would do in different situations. Now that we have a lot of different options of branches that we can take in terms of a uh, therapeutic uh, um, uh, uh, directions. So it's, it'll be interesting to see what the panel has to say uh, with our cases today. Okay, so we're going to start with ulcerative colitis. And the topics that we'll be discussing will be helping patients uh, weigh risk biologic medications. We'll discuss therapeutic options for a moderate flare of ulcerative colitis. And then we'll give you some practical, practical advice on therapeutic drug monitoring as well as discussing de escalation and discontinuation of therapy. Okay, so we'll present the case to you now. So this is a 29-year-old uh, woman with a history of ulcerative pancolitis. This was diagnosed when she presented with abdominal bloating, mucus, blood in stools for about three months. And then eventually the symptoms went away without treatment. Five months later, she presents with urgency, mucus, 10 bloody bowel movements a day, nocturnal bowel movements, abdominal cramping, nausea, and weight loss. She has no fevers. She's never used any NSAIDs or recent antibiotic use. Uh, she's had no family history of IBD. She's a non-smoker, and she's had no extra intestinal manifestations. Uh, when she first presents, she has a hemoglobin of 12.2. Her LFTs are normal. Her albumin is 3.5, and her CRP is at 1.8. Uh, ESR is 19, and uh, she has negative stool studies. So on colonoscopy, uh, she has diffuse erythema, erosions, and granularity, friability, and absent vascular patterns in the rectum to the mid-transverse. Uh, the ascending and proximal transverse were normal in appearance, and she has a cecal patch. Um, so she's roughly Mayo to moderate uh, severe colitis. So in pathology, we see that she, it confirms that she has moderately active chronic colitis in the cecum, distal, transverse, descending colon, sigmoid, and rectum. So Dr. Schwartz, with this finding, are there any other diagnostics that would be helpful for this newly diagnosed IBD patient? Is there anything else that you would like to, to look for? Um, so usually when someone, for, at first diagnosis, I like to get some small ball imaging just to make sure we're not uh, missing Crohn's. So I probably would get either an MRE or CT enterography at this point. And then do you think that the MR enterography is enough, or do you find that, do you think the capsule is something that we should be considering to stage the small bowel? Uh, I, we, we, I tend to um, just stick with the, the imaging and, and don't use capsule other than uh, for times where we, we feel someone might have some small bowel disease and it's not picked up on imaging. Okay. And with our panelists, any th other diagnostics that you think would be helpful in um, staging her disease at this time? Okay. 
That's fine. So that's what we did. She had an MRI enterography that was done. Um, she had diffuse colonic involvement with wall thickening, um, and uh, she had um, basically, in keeping with her uh, ulcerative colitis, and there was no evidence of small bowel involvement. What was important about the last uh, colonoscopy, there wasn't any imaging uh, or mention of her TI, so it was important to at least get some understanding of what was going there, going on there. And I think also it's kind of interesting the fecal calprotectin level there, uh, greater than 2,000. Um, so there may be some degree. It might give you a sense of the degree of severity in her case. Okay, so moving on. So first audience response question to you all. So what would you recommend as the initial treatment for this young woman with moderate extensive colitis? I'll, I'll say some of the options for now. A, oral mesalamines, 4.8 grams. Uh, oral mesalamine with mesalamine. D, prednisone with taper to transition to 6MP. E, infliximab, 5 mg per kg. Or F, vedolizumab at 300 milligrams. Okay, so it looks like most of you would go with a prednisone taper with a transition to mesalamine. Okay, so I'm going to um, trans now go back to our panelists. And uh, Dr. Hummus, how would you, uh, how, what would be your initial treatment strategy for, for this patient? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Great to see you at this time. Thanks, Jen. So I think uh, I'm completely uh, in agreement with, uh, with the audience here. Usually, for milder cases, you might just consider only the, the mesalamine. Mesalamine, after all, is just is actually an effective aspirin, nothing more than that. Uh, in mild cases, you would be able to now combine it with MMX type of products to stay uh, local, especially if folks already had a nasty experience on steroids. Mm -hmm. But for this case, she just comes in, she wants relief in one to two days, so I would absolutely stick with that choice. Okay. Any other differences in opinion with this uh, management? Um, I, I might, so my experience in, has been when, if someone's sick enough to need steroids, usually the 5-ACA is probably not going to be strong enough to keep them off steroids for the next 12 months, so I might think about doing, adding on one of the other options, either 6-MP or maybe vetalizumab and that, after the steroid initial treatment. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, Dr. Abreu, um, what are your endpoints to assess therapeutic response and when do you perform these assessments? Well, I, I think it, it sort of depends on how quickly the agents that you're adding on work. You know, for something like 40 milligrams of prednisone, especially in a virgin, really within the first 10 minutes after mm -hmm. taking prednisone, they're going to feel better. I'm right. exaggerating. But, um, you know, I tell the GI fellows that that's going to be the, the quickest fix on a weekend. Um, for the first time, you know, the mojo gets lost after a while. And so I think mostly I would base it on clinical assessments Having a baseline fecal calprotectin is helpful as a point of comparison. Um, we find that there's a very high ratio of our ordering fecal calprotectin and patients not doing fecal calprotectin. <laughs> Does that happen in LA? Absolutely. <laughs> <clears throat> and so we're trying to figure out if we need to give people like poop containers, things like to make it more glamorous to collect their stool because they don't love doing it. And certainly a very good way to, to, um, to lose a not lose a patient, but rather make someone unsatisfied as doing a flex dig every five minutes. I mean, I like doing them, uh, but I think patients don't love doing it. So I think that in the initial stages, I'd probably base it on clinical stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I was going to add something like Veto in the future or Infliximab in the future or something else in the future, I'd probably want to know the, the ba what baseline I'm starting with. So it kind of depends on, on that. Um, and then I think for someone like this, just out of the gate, I would give her a chance to be able to taper off the steroids and stay on a mesalamine alone. Mm -hmm. And I think often what can happen is we are reluctant to use steroids. Like it was very wonderful that most of you picked prednisone because something like budesonide in the colonic release form, that's cute and can work in a, in a milder case. But when they're, when they're sick like this, then you're kind of spitting out a fire and then they keep getting worse over time. And then it's harder to bring them back from that, from that edge. So I think something does happen that it's hard to bring them back and you might need to escalate therapy unnecessarily because of that. Okay, absolutely. So that kind of leads to the next question. So it, it, I'll go on to what she ended up having done first. But she, uh, if she had a steroid taper, you would give a trial of mesalamine again. Dr. Schwartz or Dr. Hummus, would you go on to something else or would you go back to mesalamine, give her a trial of the mesalamine for maintenance? No, after would, a steroid taper. Yeah, I would definitely, this is first time out of the gate, and we know from historic studies that basically a lot of these folks are well maintained on mesalamine. It's a pretty effective. Um, so I would definitely give that a try, Jen. Gotcha. And, and Dr. Schwartz, it sounded like you were leaning towards something else, like going to, on to more Yeah, I, 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 I would probably give 
her one chance to come off steroids, but then very quickly move on to something else. Gotcha. Okay. And um, Dr. Breu, so um, now there's a lot of, 6MP is getting a lot of bad rap these days. Yeah. And um, in terms of finding maintenance therapy and someone who's going to be transitioning on to, uh, you know, to another maintenance therapy, um, are you using 6MP monotherapy for maintenance or are you considering vedalizumab in these patients more? Yeah. Gosh, you asked such a great question, Jenny. I think that, you know, um, over time, the window or the, the opportunity to use 6MP as monotherapy keeps getting reduced uh, because of issues with toxicity. In some cases, I actually think it's because patients are driving us to get away from anything that has these toxicities. Uh, and uh, for all intents and purposes, vedalizumab, you know, is, is very safe. I actually think all of the biologics on Knockwood that we have currently are very safe, you know, even the ones with black box warnings. I think some of that is political and not necessarily a medical decision of what the black box warning will be. So probably in her, I'd use vedalizumab. I, I will admit to that. Um, I, could, I already am imagining the discussion because she's going to want to get pregnant and, and the 6MP and the class, you know, and the class D. You know, I can, I can already see this. So some of it is my uh, being an evil person and not wanting to spend so much time, uh, you know, discussing all those things. <laughs> okay. And now if, um, Dr. Hamas, if this was an elderly patient, um, do you, does this change your consideration on, on what you would consider for, for maintenance? And Sorry, if she's? If she's elder, like, so she, if she were elderly, so she's over the age of 65, presented with first presentation. How about 70? How about 70? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <I'm laughs> yeah, so she, if she's 85, uh, Jen. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, well, the, the Cezanne in, in the, from the Jutet group uh, showed us uh, there's this risk for elderly folks and the lymphoma formation, so I wouldn't mess with uh, 6MP in that population for sure. I think that's a kind of a warning sign in general, elder age, reconsider your immunosuppressives, especially the thiopurins, yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay, so moving on. The patient was started on Lialda first. She is very averse to any immunosuppression. So she was started on Lialda at 4.8 grams once a day. And from one month, she did not feel better. In fact, her symptoms got a lot worse. She eventually did start a prednisone taper, and her symptoms were 100% resolved, as Maria is saying. If you want something quick, that's, that's what worked for her. So she then tapered her prednisone and remained on the Lialda, uh, 4.8 grams again. And six months later, she flared, and then she was started on um, budesonate MMX uh, for nine milligrams once a day, and uh, she did not feel better, so she started on another prednisone taper, but this did not work very well for her. Uh, eventually, she did was started on 6MP, but she said she absolutely hated it, <laughs> and she stopped this electively and remained on prednisone, um, 20 milligrams, and had been in on, on a prednisone taper, so she had been on about 20 milligrams by the time she had seen, seen you in the office for about one month. So she's absolutely terrified of all immunosuppressants, and she wants more time to explore natural options before considering any medications. And she's here for a consultation with you to discuss what those options are. So our first mini lecture will be Dr. Schwartz, and he'll be talking to us about how he weighs some of the risks and benefits and how he communicates this with his patients. Well, thank you, and it's an honor to be asked to speak here. So uh, the first thing I'll say is that in Tennessee, all the patients listen to us and they never disagree with our recommendations. So this is sort of <laughs> foreign to me, but I'll try to, try to help you out. Um, so the, the treatment goals um, with are, are multifold. So it's always been symptom improvement, but now we're, we really want to move on to help um, reduce some of the complications that can occur with chronic inflammation. So minimize hospitalization and ultimately, obviously avoid surgery if we can. Um, so as far as that's uh, concerned, and we were avoiding complications, we want to avoid complications of the disease itself, avoid complications potentially of the medications we're using. We, uh, by controlling inflammation, hopefully we'll reduce the risk of malignancy. And then now more and more we're really shooting for mucosal healing and maybe even histologic healing in patients. And it's interesting, when you um, look at what's important to patients and what's important to us as clinicians, there's a little bit of a divergence. So when you ask patients, they, um, as we, you'd kind of expect, want complete symptom relief and want to have an improved quality of life. Whereas ga as gastroenterologists, we're increasingly focused on the importance of mucosal healing and, uh, and want to have that normal colonoscopy. So there's a little bit of a split when we um, try to align on, on goals for therapy. So when you look at, when patients are asked, 
what they want, and, and physicians are asked, gastroenterologists are asked what they want. Um, the main discrepancy um, has to do with, again, symptom relief versus endoscopic improvement with us as gastroenterologists focused on, on the um, improvement in colonoscopy. And um, the, the whole concept of shared decision making is fairly new, and the idea is that um, we partner with our patients to agree on a, a goal for therapy. And again, um, I think this is very regional. When you go, I go around and talk, um, what is true for, for our patients in Nashville are probably quite a bit different, I would imagine, in New York or Miami or in L.A. Um, so when uh, patients are asked, uh, most people want to have a 50-50 split where the doctor and you agree on the treatment uh, recommendations. If you were to ask my patients, I think it would be more uh, of that purple or blue bar where they're, they're really... Um, looking to me to make a decision and, and will trust what I have to say. Uh, of course, there are still some patients like this patient where they're very reluctant to go on medication and, and we try to meet in the middle and find what, what's appropriate for them, both from a uh, disease severity standpoint, but also from a risk tolerance. So the kind of the keys to communicating risk and benefits of the medication um, should be multifold. So you want to avoid using small percentages like 0 0.06 and use a little, a little more easy to understand numbers like 6 out of 10,000, which is the risk we usually quote as a risk of lymphoma with combination therapy. Um, we want to use uh, comparisons of using a common denominator, and we want to um, describe uh, both um, the gains and also the potential risks of the medication, because I think if you discuss risks of medications um, without putting in the context of the risk of undertreated disease, it really is unfair and it's hard for the patient to understand why you're recommending the different um, medications you're risking. And, um, and, and then um, kind of agree on um, not, not using vague descriptors such as rare or common, but using concrete numbers to describe the risk of the medication. So the, here's the, the numbers that I, we normally quote when we're talking about starting an anti-TNF. So um, when you think about stopping therapy for any adverse events, it's about 10%. Um, basic injection, infusion reactions, uh, it, it were anywhere between 3 and 20%. Drug-related uh, lupus-like complications, very rare, 1%. And um, skin manifestations, um, even rare, about 1% is usually what we, what we quote. And you can see the risk of both TB, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and other uh, multi rare complications such as uh, multiple sclerosis there. So these are the numbers I usually quote to patients when we're discussing uh, these various medications. And it's hard for, I think, anyone to kind of com com comprehend what two or uh, six out of 10,000 actually is. This is a, a scatter plot that uh, Corey Siegel sort of pioneered. And everyone's baseline risk of uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is about one to two out of 10,000 per year. Um, people have co really come in hearing that the risk of lymphoma with uh, anti-TNFs goes up about two or four times, and that's a terrifying number, but when you put it in context and you show this graphically, I think it's easier for patients to understand that it's really quite a rare complication uh, of the medications we're choosing. So, and this is the risk what goes up with starting anti-TNF monotherapy. Again, it's still a very, very rare manifestation uh, of that uh, complication of that medication. And then even, even more helpful, I think, is to put it in a context with other things that people may be afraid of. So if you look at the risk of developing lymphoma, as I mentioned, with combination therapy, about 6 out of 10,000, when you compare that to a risk of something that people might be afraid of, such as drowning in a year, um, it's even lower than that. So 10, that's the risk of, of drowning in one year would be about 10 out of 10,000. Um, so again, you can see patients, I think, better understand that this is a truly rare complication of, of the medication. And then you need to balance that with the risk of disease progression or under treatments. When you look at the risk of colectomy in ulcerative colitis, by about um, 10 years, the risk is about 20%. So it's a real uh, possibility, and, and we want to prevent that. And the ways we do that is to use the appropriate medication, hopefully get rid of all the inflammation that's there and, and let, uh, so the colon goes back to normal and reduce that risk of disease flaring and also of um, uh, progression to, to dysplasia or cancer. The way, kind of the way I like to describe it, both to our fellows and the patients, is you need to think of IBD as a chronic and progressive destructive process of the intestine, and so we want to stop that chronic progression, and a lot of times that can be progressing even in the absence of clinical symptoms, and that's why we recommend things like fecal calprotectin or endoscopy to make sure whatever therapy we choose is actually working and, and getting the mucosa to return to normal. And there is this concept of this window of opportunity where patients present 
with active disease the, for their first flare, much as, as this uh, woman did. And um, this is, the inflammation is, is new enough that it hasn't caused any damage yet. It hasn't caused the complications we typically worry about, such as fistulas or abscesses with Crohn's disease or, or um, cancer uh, dysplasia with UC. And by treating appropriately, we can progress that uh, natural history, pro uh, pr prevent that progression to have any of those complications occur. So in other words, by getting rid of all the inflammation during that window of opportunity, we can hopefully prevent some of the things we worry about happening uh, with ongoing uncontrolled inflammation. And there's lots of studies that have been done that sort of demonstrate that concept. This is from the, the, the top down step up treatment in patients who had normal endoscopy at the end of the initial study, which was at year two. And they looked at, at those patients at year three and year four. Those that had a normal endoscopy at the end of two years were much more likely to be in complete remission, much more likely to be off steroids, and much uh, less likely to have any complications such as surgery or hospitalizations. And then uh, furthermore, um, in the, just to de demonstrate the benefit of mucosal healing, in this uh, cohort study of 214 patients, this is Crohn's but not UC, um, Patients that achieved either partial or um, complete mucosal healing were much less likely to need surgery, much more likely to um, have uh, disease-free survival, and much less likely to be hospitalized. So again, a kind of pushing therapy, hitting hard during that window of opportunity, um, really improved outcomes in that patient population as well. And there have been um, a few uh, studies looking at this uh, as a meta-analysis, particularly looked at mucosal healing and the benefit for both clinical remission and colectomy over time. And you can see in both the um, scatter plots that uh, achieving mucosal healing led to more like likelihood of being in clinical remission and less likelihood of needing uh, colectomy over time. So in conclusion, um, we want to frame the discussion always in terms of risk of treatment, but also um, the risk of the treatment options and also the risk of disease progression. I think a lot of times we forget to um, include that in the overall risk-benefit analysis. We want to listen to what the patient's goals are for therapy and, and use that, those uh, individual goals to try to meet them halfway in the treatment options we, we pick. And then we want to personalize therapy based on not only disease severity and the risk of progression, but also the patient's individual risk tolerance and the goals for therapy. So in this particular patient, obviously, she, her risk tolerance is quite low. She has severe disease, and we're, you know, we want to try to meet her somewhere in the middle to, to pick the correct option for her uh, so that we get her well and, and um, hopefully get to that end point of mucosal healing. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have this extensive, long conversation. And she decides she still wants to wait, look into other options. And she's looking into a naturopath in Santa Monica. Um, so she's thankful, and she's open to some more diagnostics. But uh, she doesn't want any other treatments at this time. What do you do at this point, Dr. Hamas? Do you, do you stop at the door, tell her, don't leave? Or um, what would you do? Or Dr. Breyer, do you have any ideas on what at this point, she's telling you this. You know she's going to need therapy. Uh, she's deciding that she doesn't think she can take the risk. How, how do you counsel her at this point? You're looking at me? Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that the important thing in someone like this, and, and they, they're by coastal people, I think, and I'm coming to your place next. All right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think they're by coastal people, and I think it's important to maybe share with them that you're open to most anything that they could think to do that you're going to try to counsel them against things that are clearly unsafe, but that that this should be done in in in, um, in partnership with medical therapy that's been tried and true and tested in huge clinical trials. I think people don't quite understand that um, the the length to which the to to which these clinical trials are done that are so precise in hundreds of patients versus people on a website or blogging about like they tried something and it worked and look. Like it's an N of one, and they're like fascinated by that N of one, which is amazing, right? How how people can distort reality, and people like this. I think the other thing to counsel them is that, and I've seen this, and I'm, all of us have seen this here, is they go away and they get so unbelievably sick, you may not be able to get them back. You really could, you know. I had as an anecdote, someone went to Hawaii for like some weird therapy and high colonics and all this stuff, and she ended up having a colectomy. There was nothing we could do. She came back so abruptly sick, because those things change the microbiome in a negative way sometimes. And so I think that that's the kind of thing, that you want them to think you're cool, even if you're kind of not, so that they 
will allow you to treat them with real medications. Yeah, so we tried to be cool, but not cool <laughs> enough. So um, Dr. Hamas, would you take any other steps now to prepare for future therapies? Yeah, I just l would like to mention being now, you know, in California, <laughs> you know, all these natural things. I love them, you know, I participate, but um, I don't want her to lose, to, to be, I don't want to lose her off the radar, you know. So, so I like these studies that came out uh, a while ago using curcumin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, especially for somebody who's basically in clinical remission and really wants nothing to mm -hmm. do with traditional meds, that's a good bridge. Yeah. And yeah. that's been kind of a, a lifeline to keep them on the, on the radar. Otherwise, you'll see them yeah. back in the ER, and uh, as Maria said, you know, you can't do anything. Okay. So that's my uh, take on uh, naturopathic uh, steps. What was your question again? Yeah, so, um, you know, just simple things. <laughs> so, I mean, we were pre she was oh. okay with certain okay. tests, so we went ahead and those. checked those as well. <laughs> in, in addition to all the counseling, she was, she was kind of, we're, we're, we're already preparing her for, for things to come in the future. Um, so she has an indeterminate quantifier on gold test. Um, Dr. Schwartz, are you concerned about that? Yes. Um, so this uh, does happen occasionally, particularly in people who are on, on steroids. There's a, a test called um, T-spot, which they use in the HIV patients that sort of overcomes that uh, indeterminate test. So I probably would get a chest X-ray and a T-spot and make sure that's not real. Gotcha. So she has no TB risk factors, chest X-ray is normal. I think we were fine with this at this point. Yeah. Okay. So she comes back one month later and she is ready to proceed with further treatment. She has gotten, she's become more sick. Her CRP is at 0.8. Her hemoglobin is at 8.1, albumin is 2.6, and her ESR is at 30. She's having six bowel movements a day, all bowel movements with blood and no urgency, and most of the bowel movements are nocturnal. She has multiple trips at night. She's lost about 14 pounds. Uh, she's, uh, her BMI is at 16. She has nausea without vomiting, only improved with marijuana gummies. Uh, she has no abdominal pain, no fevers, no joint pains, or no ulcers in her mouth. At that point, it's been a while. So, you know, she gets a flex sig for restaging, and if she has some severe activity uh, now. Uh, no viral inclusion, CMV is negative. So, audience response. We have, you can see, I'm not going to list off all the options. We have quite a lot of options now available. Um, so I would like you guys to weigh in on what you would do next for this patient. The most, of, most of you have uh, decided you'd like to do either five mix per kg of uh, infliximab combination therapy or uh, the higher dose. Okay, very good. Okay, so Dr. Schwartz, what would you recommend for treatment and why? Um, so she's really sick uh, and she's losing ground quickly. So I, I, and she's on the verge of needing to be in the hospital. So I probably would consider one of the anti-TNFs and would likely do um, more of accelerated dosings or dose stacking. Um, so probably higher than the normal dose, at least for the first couple of doses, just to kind of very quickly get her better. And uh, which uh, anti-TNF would you consider? Oh boy. Um, so I probably, in this case, I probably would consider infliximab or, um, and would probably do 10 milligrams per kilogram. Okay. And, um, Let's say you have a conversation her, you know, with her to reassure about risks. We talked about that already. But let's say, would you consider combination therapy in her? And does it matter if you do combination therapy versus not? Does that affect your dosing strategies or how you would how you think about the anti-TNF, uh, Dr. Hamas? <laughs> Uh, Combination so, therapy yeah, versus not. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So basically, rescue for me, I, I have the same choice as David, because just traditionally, when we use this in practice, Remicade just gives very quick responses. We, you know, we did those studies and to look at 24-hour, 48-hour uh, responses to, to see what's happening in the gut. So that would be definitely my choice. Uh, obviously, we'll probably talk a little bit about dosing, but 10 MIGs is absolutely also my choice because mm -hmm. they need more antibody when they're, they're sick like this. And because of they still have that mouse you know, portion on the antibody, which is prone on the long term to, uh, to get you into risk for antibody formation, I definitely would start with uh, an immune suppressives. And also we've learned a lot from studies like Sonic and, and, and combining those, uh, those two, that you optimize your anti-TNF therapy brilliantly by combining that with a, mm -hmm. with a thiopurine, so yes. How do you convince somebody to go on combination when they're already resistant to go on a biologic? Slowly. <laughs> so what like I usually do, I never, I mean, this is a sick woman, right? Mm -hmm. So we made mistakes uh, coming up to this point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
uh, in, our, in our kind of preventative strategies. But suppose she's here now, definitely she, you know, she's aware, she's really feeling sick. So she's more prone, I guess, and open to accept these uh, strategies. But you need to convince her that, you know, if I start reading the package insert of 6MP, you know, there's clear death when you, when you take your tablet. And so you really need to put that in perspective and teach them uh, that the dosages we use of thiopurine are quite low compared to how we've used them. So, you know, I take them through a careful, you know, educational, if you will, guidance mm -hmm. before they uh, basically are onboarded. Gotcha. Okay, so a question for Dr. Abreu. Let's say she had a history of prior malignancy. Um, does that change the way what you would consider for this patient or, or not? Um, well, I, it's kind of related to the one you just asked. I think that in the very short run, though, in the very short run, in those first few weeks when you've started on infliximab, even though for sure if she was on a thiopurine already, the levels of the anti-TNF will be higher in anyone on a thiopurine, even from the very first dose. The same is true with methotrexate. Even from the very first dose, the levels of the of the drug will be higher. So even well before you have a chance to make antibodies, somehow it reduces the clearance of the drugs. And that's all great. However, if someone who had, I think she had, you know, I think she was on 6MP before. But if someone has never been on 6MP before, or on a thiopurine before, I may not choose to give them the thiopurine to start because in the short run, when they're very sick, you can only get toxicity and not enough of an effect. In other words, that small percentage of people who have the idiosyncratic reactions, pancreatitis, high fevers, blah, 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 we don't know who that, we don't have a test for that, right? We do TPMT testing to make sure that they can tolerate it from a, from a hematopoietic standpoint, but the idiosyncratic reactions we yet don't test for because the genes actually haven't been identified, but clearly there's a genetic thing. So in those patients, I may not mm -hmm. do it because of that reason that it might confuse you, right? Like it's three weeks, four weeks into treatment, they have fevers, they have a pain, and you're thinking, oh my God, they've perfed. So um, with prior malignancy, so, uh, so again, the prior malignancy thing, obviously all things lymphoma related, I wouldn't do a thiopurine. We now have, you know, building literature that anti-TNF therapy in patients who've had previous malignancies really seems quite safe. Um, I think everything has to be taken both with a, um, both from a kind of a, I try to think through it from a biological perspective as well as from a psychiatric perspective. So from a biologic perspective, I do actually give thought to whether, an, whether TNF is important in trying to uh, sur have surveillance of a previous malignancy. I don't know if that makes sense. So for example, things like a melanoma. I might be reluctant to use an anti-TNF if because there are melanomas that come back to haunt you a long time later. So depending on the grade of the melanoma, depending on the grade of the breast cancer, I might be reluctant, even though the data are that it's reasonably safe to do. Certainly, I would opt for vetalizumab in any situation like that. And since this is ulcerative colitis, there's even more of a reason to say, ah, maybe let's think about it. Maybe we can bridge her with some steroids and give give her the vetalizumab. So I think I think th and then th there's the psychiatry of it, which is the fact that. If someone, depending on the malignancy they've had, uh, you know, it's hard to accept going on immunosuppressive therapy, and I think one could understand how someone would feel about that. Now, if someone presented very severe with a history of, of malignancy that you're concerned about, would you still go with the anti-TNF? I given would. That the, I would. You know, I, again, all things kind of be, being equal. Like, again, it depends on mm -hmm. the type of the malignancy right. it was and, and all those things. But, again, the literature, mostly from Ashwin, right, David? Mostly from Ashwin and Anna Krishna from uh, MGH, where he's kind of scoured, um, <laughs> my words, um, the literature and the and the, like the available databases of malignancies and found uh, in t and actually I've, I've tried to make a slide out of this it's impossible because it's table after table that is hard to you know hard to kind of parse through but the long and the short of it is that there really is not an increased signal that patients who've had a prior malignancy have an increased rate of recurrence <coughs> all right thank you
So she refuses the 6 empire azathioprine, but we start her on infliximab at 10 mg per kg monotherapy. So she sees you one week later after her first infusion, and she has fewer bowel movements. She doesn't feel very good still. She's, uh, you know, she has about 50% still blood in her stools. Um, her, uh, her CRP is at 0 0.8, it's a little better. ESR is 36, but she's become more anemic. Her hemoglobin's at 7.2, and her MCV is at 72.8. Her iron is at 20, her TIBC is 258, her percent SAT is at 8, and ferritin is 21. So um, would you make any changes to her current therapeutic regimen right now, Dr. Schwartz? Well, first, I think you need to address the iron deficiency anemia, and um, I think we as a group kind of forget this, so I probably would set her up for uh, iron infusions mm -hmm. in the near future. Um, and then she has already received the, the one dose of the 10 milligrams per kilogram. I probably would follow that with a second one fairly shortly thereafter. To, How to, soon after? Um, so in someone who's ambulatory, I might do, might do it at um, week one or maybe we, we'd wait till week two. In the hospital, we might do it at day five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so this is interesting. She's doing this all as an outpatient, but she's presenting quite severe even, even as an outpatient. So she receives two iron infusions, and she sees you two weeks after the second infusion, and she says, I feel great, doctor. New woman. Awesome. Two bowel movements a day, no nocturnal bowel movements, no blood in her stools. Her weight has improved, and she's eating a little better. Her CRP has decreased to 0 0.3. Her hemoglobin's at 10.5. MCV's at 80, and her albumin's at 4.1. So Dr. Hamas, though, you know, so I... Um, I, I've been playing around with the infliximab levels. I, I did send one a little earlier because I, she presented so severe and I was really interested to see uh, where she was going to be. And I was very, uh, that, I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you make of this, Dr. Hummus? Yeah, first of all, was this a trough? This is a Are trough. Are you sure it's a trough? Absolutely, well, uh-huh. Yeah, so yeah, it's way too low, obviously. Right. There's hardly any drug there measurable. So obviously, I'd like to comment on the, on the previous note, you know, how do you know in clinic after a week of giving your infusions when clinic is like so-so? I think the drop in CRP is a big mm -hmm. handle on you know, that you can be rest assured that she's going to have a biologic effect, okay? So, and we saw that. But obviously, uh, to answer your question, this is just uh, way too low. So uh, you give in 10 mix per kick, she, she consumes it. You know, there's a significant consumption. Mm -hmm. Does she lose it? Uh, you know, uh, th those are all the questions. Is she clearing? There's a high clearance. Mm -hmm. Maybe some loss, loss through blood loss in, in her, uh, in her, in her colon. So. Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Bayou, how would you respond to this? I think she is feeling better. The reason why it was sent is because she felt so poorly after her set, her first infusion, mm -hmm. and we we sent it a little earlier. But you know, typically the recommendation maybe wait until week 14. But you know, this was interesting to find out earlier. How would you respond to this now? She She's got two doses better. so far. Jane? She had two doses. Yeah, I think we put her on a pump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. She had three doses by now. Okay, she had three yeah. doses. Mm -hmm. Continuous infusion. So this is now going to be the eight week. This is going to be the eight week. Yeah. Step. I mean, I would never let them go for eight weeks uh, for someone this severe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Even though she felt amazing after this. Yeah. One. This is a recipe for disaster because they'll become immunized. Mm -hmm. the, this is the perfect storm. They'll, they'll be great. And then... With the, with the fourth infusion, they've made antibodies. It's really scary. It's really so scary. when would you bring her back? for? I mean, or like I would probably bring her back. You know, we're making this up because at least in Miami, the insurance companies are hell. Uh, well, and I, I mean, maybe it's <laughs> much no better. There's no difference here. There's no, really, it's awful, absolutely awful. Um, in the sense of even trying to get 7.5 as an, as an outpatient, trying to lie. Um, I sort of think that we should have like you know, dumbbells that we hang on the patient so their weight is artificially made higher so that we can give them a higher dose. I mean, so in, in all, all things being equal, I'd give it right away. As soon as I got that level, I'd give them 10 mix per kg and, and do it every four weeks. Mm -hmm. I'd uh, keep doing it, keep doing it. There's a summation effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And once you get the fire out, put out, you know, I, I use the, the, the California flyers as an analogy. Once it's out, it's much easier to kind of maintain it and then start stretching out the intervals and then ultimately lowering the dose over time. But in this situation, it's 10 every four, 10 every four. Okay, so she, um, there's several things that we checked at that time. Yeah. So she had a fecal calprotectin, which was great. It was at 81. Um, she decreased the interval at yeah. uh, to six. Um, and so she was uh, still refusing an immunomodulator at that time. Um, so 
interestingly, as uh, uh, Dr. Abreu was pointing out, before her week 12 infusion, all of a sudden her CRP is at 3.6. ESR is at 59. Her albumin went to 3.6. But she says she feels great and she loves her infliximab. So um, that's a quote. That's awesome. uh, so of course I checked the levels again, oh. they're not there. Not so there. Um, I think lesson here is perhaps if you see that do do the infusion much earlier. I'm not sure if she would still be able to salvage at that, you know, if, if she were given it right, I'm not sure if she were given it right after. That's why timing is, is was something I was curious about with the last infusion she received after week six. Um, so um, with that, I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Abreu talk more about um, therapeutic drug monitoring. <laughs> Well, I'm going to take 30 seconds of my talk to thank Jenny so much for considering inviting me back to my alma mater. See, it says I'm an alumni. And so um, it's great to be back. Thank you, Eric and, and Gary, for you know having me speak here. Um, I was a UCLA GI fellow when it was the land of giants. And so it's uh, fantastic to be back and see a lot of old friends. Um, and I actually um, got to meet Sherman Melenkoff, and you know, he, he would still come around and talk to the GI fellows, and uh, as did Art Schwabi, who's you know, maybe not so well known anymore, but again, they were absolutely brilliant people. So as it says here, this is, you know, she asked me to talk about the practical approach. I'm gonna tell you kind of what I do. Um, so these are the biologics that we have. Um, some are for ulcerative colitis, some are for Crohn's disease and um, you know, used to kinemab and vedalizumab, et cetera. So what's the concept of therapeutic drug monitoring? That you need a certain amount of drug to have a biologic effect. That kind of seems you know, intuitive, that you need, you need to have drug around. And the amount of drug exposure needed to achieve this biologic effect, in this case, we'll say mucosal healing, in the case of this young woman, may vary based on the characteristics of the patient. So that if you have someone with, uh, with, with uh, a, a, a high BMI, and very severe disease, those patients are gonna consume a lot more of certain drugs. And, and it, uh, again, depends on the drug. I might say now, while I still have your attention maybe, that, for example, in the panis of fat that someone with a, a fat belly has, for example, no, not looking at anyone in this audience, there's a lot of local TNF production. And so I describe to my patients that anti-TNF is a drone. It's looking for, for TNF wherever it is. So we want this anti-TNF to go to, in her case, her colon, but if she was obese, but not just obese, because you know, um, Cubans, we have a fat ass and fat thighs, but if you've got a big belly, now you're sucking up anti-TNF into that fat belly and it's not necessarily going where you want it to go. Um, and then of course the mechanism of action of the drug also plays a role because you might have, you might need different amounts if what you're trying to achieve is a signaling effect versus just negating or uh, blocking as much of that cytokine as possible, right? So if you're making a lot of TNF, you need to saturate it with a lot of anti-TNF. If the effect is something else, well, you might be looking for something else. So this is why we have to kind of always be outsmarting um, whatever, you know, whatever biologic we're using. This is, you know, a simple diagram, but it helps in a way to explain a little bit what's happening to this patient, which is that she feels awesome, right? And the reason she feels awesome is because for a lot of the time in between infusions, she does have enough drug on board. She just runs out of steam before the next infusion. And over time, of course, this will come back to haunt us. And these low levels of antibody, the levels that are kind of below that white, you know, white bar, are, are the ones that are gonna come back to haunt us because it's in that window that patients that the immune system sees this foreign protein because it keeps going up, it keeps going down, it keeps going up, it keeps going down. And that's kind of what a pathogen might do. You get exposed, you clear it, you, it comes back. And so therefore, you uh, elicit that response. Okay. Um, so some of the factors that, are in, you know, that influence the pharmacokinetic of, of monoclonal antibody-based biologics are shown here. Um, so that we can decrease drug clearance with, with immunomodulators. That includes the thiopurines and methotrexate. So as I said earlier, um, Dan is absolutely right. It does inhibit generating antibodies, but it also has possibly a, 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 a more important effect, which is to keep the levels of the biologics just higher, even from the very first dose. Um, and then if you've made anti-drug antibodies, 
by the time you make anti-drug antibodies, you're going to be consuming a lot more of the biologic because it, you know, causes, you know, it targets them for destruction more rapidly, right? Um, low serum albumin. It's, I don't think it's that it's the low serum albumin. It's that the low serum albumin is a sign that there's much more inflammation and possibly that there's a protein-losing enteropathy in the intestine, right? So you're pooping out your albumin, but along with it comes immunoglobulins and along with it goes monoclonal antibodies, right? Uh, high baseline CRP, again, lots of inflammation. Um, as I said, it's the, it's the LA fires. You need a lot of stuff to turn those fires off. And so having a high CRP is a, is, a, is a surrogate for having a lot more inflammation. At least for now, we don't measure TNF, right? We don't measure it in the, in the circulation because actually it is elevated, but it's not necessarily a good representation of how much inflammation is going on in the colon. That would be awesome, right? To have a test where you can do that test and say, ah, that person based on that level and their size and their waist to hip ratio needs that dose, but we ain't got that, right? So we, we have to kind of make it up as we go along. High body mass index, I already described. Male sex, there's less you can do about that from my experience. Um, so general, <laughs> general principles of, of how we do this dosing and the therapeutic drug monitoring. You know, hey, what can I tell you? I think more is better. Um, and and what, what, what we're left with is that the FDA is interested in, in approving the minimally effective dose of all these drugs, right? They don't want a, a pharmaceutical company to come and say, hey, we really want to give this higher dose. They, they want to, you know, so, so and, then, and then on top of it, as if that isn't enough of a bad thing, companies often base the dose on a rheumatoid arthritis dose, or at least they start there. Do you know what I mean? They start there and they say, okay, let's multiply that by some integer. But sometimes that still undershoots it, right? Because a few hot joints, it's a, different, it's a different pathogenesis. Somehow it's a different pathogenesis. You can smell an anti-TNF and joints get better, but that's not the case with an inflamed gut. Um, generally, we check trough levels after induction whatever induction means to you. You know, in someone like this, you would have done a rapid induction, right? 10 mg per kg every five minutes, and then you're gonna have some stretch before the next dose, right? And because it takes about a week to get the anti-TNF troughs back, you know, often we're left to make clinical decisions before we have them back, right? I think that my panel, my friends would, would uh, agree to, with that. Um, and then, um, so you see best to check trough levels after induction. For early optimization, you'll see my bias of proactive testing in a second. Then I check again if there's a clinical change, but generally I check once a year in a stable patient. You know what I mean? So if there's a clinical change, sure, I'm going to do a reactive test to see if the, if the levels are okay, if this person has developed anti-drug antibodies. But I like to check it at least once a year, even if everything is smooth sailing. And I'll tell you, if someone is well, we should write this up. If someone is well and you check a level, in, for, the, for all intents and purposes, I rarely find someone who's developed antibodies to the drug. They're usually people that have perfect, like, textbook levels. Do you agree? Maybe we should write a paper later today. Um, proactive versus reactive therapeutic drug monitoring. Well, look, here, Don is going to, like, report me to the, to, like, the uh, Belgian mafia of IBDologists because I'm not showing the paper sh that tells you that checking levels proactively is, you know, their data are that it wasn't helpful. But I have all sorts of explanation for why, even though the glove didn't fit, he was guilty, okay? <laughs> so in this case, this is a study done by a couple of uh, groups, actually, but the, the kind of the person who got this party started was, um, was Adam Chaffetz, who's at, at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. I think he did this work a little bit with Jim Lewis at Penn. And, and this is kind of just what happened in practice, right? There were some doctors who were checking proactively levels of anti-TNF, and those that kind of were just waiting to see if the patient lost response before they checked the level. And you can see that those, those patients that had proactive testing ended up staying on infliximab, i.e., they were continuing to do well, we presume, and those that had reactive testing, well, they fell off the cliff. All right, I'm going to skip that. Oh, well, maybe just that this is like, a, if, when do I do proactive testing? Before my first maintenance dose, whatever, whenever that's going to be. Do you know what I mean? If I've decided they're going to be dosed every four weeks, okay, it's at the, you know, after the first three, you know, the, before the fourth dose of something, of some biologic, as an example. How high is the bar set, right? So this is El Capitan, for those of you that uh, have been to Yosemite. Well, 
if we want it just to make someone feel better, you don't need a whole lot to make them feel better, right? She started feeling better even with the first couple, you know, first dose or so, if I remember correctly from the case. Then a little bit of a higher bar is clinical remission. That for all intents and purposes, they're back to the baseline before they ever knew how to spell ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. Endoscopic healing, that their intestines look better. Now we even get microscopic healing, right? We do these colonoscopies on UC patients, and the pathologist says to you, there's no patho there's nothing, that this is a completely normal. You're seeing pseudopops, you're seeing scarring, but yet the pathologist, under the microscope, these are perfectly aligned crypts. This is awesome. And then finally, you know, we'll, we, you know uh, fistula healing, that we, uh, that, that we have found um, that you really need the highest levels of anti-TNF in order to close a hole. And I, I think that stands to reason. These are higher and higher bars that we set, and perhaps not coincidentally, you need higher levels of the anti-TNF to achieve these bars. So this is my analogy for, for the forest fire. We did a study um, that was not my idea. In fact, I thought, I we're going to do this study, you know, kind of don't we know what, we, what we're going to find, but it turned out to be really very interesting. Andres Yar is now in Wisconsin, and he's really so smart. And this, this study, in this study, we measured tissue levels of the anti-TNF and tissue levels of TNF, right? Because everyone had been hand-waving that, oh, you know, in an inflamed colon, you lose more of the anti-TNF and, you know, blah, again, a lot of hand-waving. And in this study, we found that, okay, fine, the more inflammation, the higher the level of TNF in the tissue. And then there's this bimodal thing. I don't know if that's the right word, but you, when, you know, when you have inflammation, actually the anti-TNF, so in this case, infliximab, adalimumab levels, are much higher in inflamed colon. Like there's more of it than there is in an uninflamed colon. So actually, we didn't know that until we started measuring that. But if you have very severe inflammation, now the level goes down. And I think that's probably loss of the anti-TNF, you know, as a sieve because of, the in, because of the inflammation. Now, that part I can't prove. But again, this, this is the observation we made. Um, and I think we already heard, there are several different so studies, cohorts, describing that in severe acute ulcerative colitis, you need to keep escalating the dose, either rapidly escalate the dose or, again, start high, start high, start high. It's made easier if they're in the hospital because most of our hospitals, uh, more, more recently, don't give us pushback about giving infliximab. But, of course, we're in academic medical centers, and I know that some of you may face uh, an issue with your pharmacy when you want to do that in the hospital. And so this kind of takes you through the algorithm of, of, of uh, reactive tr therapeutic drug monitoring. There's nothing really kind of that new in this, in this uh, slide other than to say to you, if someone has very high levels of the anti-TNF, that's the situation where you're considering going to a different mechanism when they're not doing well, right? So before you're going to make a therapeutic decision, I think it is useful to check anti-TNF levels because if they're, you know, greater than the limit of detection, that would be the easiest example and they're not responding, then you need to move on. Whether that moving on is surgery, whether that moving on is their nuts, whether that moving on is you know, changing to a different biologic with a different mechanism. Conversely, um, if you know, in this example of this particular patient, had she made antibodies to the anti-TNF, then I think the easy choice would be to change her to a different anti-TNF because we, we already know she's a responder. Uh, VETO levels, higher levels are better. I'll skip that. You know that too. Um, Eustachinumab, we're still playing around with what's the optimal level. I, I'll speak for myself. That's what, how I feel at the moment. In this particular study, essentially they dichotomized the patients and it was the magic level was 4.5 above and below. Um, I still think we're, we're not there yet in terms of our understanding and I still think we're underdosing Eustachinumab. That's, you know, maybe that'll come up with other, other cases. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to kind of speed through the latter half of this case. So um, interestingly, we check her liver enzymes as well. This is before. This is at her week 12 uh, infusion. So we find that her AST, ALT are elevated to 250s. Um, so she feels fine. She actually has no symptoms at all. Uh, so, we, you know, we want to... She wants to follow this out. Um, she doesn't get her, we wanted it weekly. She checks her next set of labs 14 days later and her ALTs in the thousands. Um, she also has new joint pains. So what is going on? Dr. Hamas? what would you do next with this? 
And so, uh, remember, this is, this is Remicade, right? This is Still, Remicade. Still, no, no thiopurines? No thiopurines. Um, and any other complementary therapies mm -hmm. or no, any other yeah, drug No, we asked reduced? about complement, right, so no complementary therapies, but that's an important question to rule out Dilly. Yeah, because usually you would expect that. Um, and I have to say that I can't read the numbers correctly. <laughs> Sorry, it's mainly a very high, very high, very transaminitis. Yeah. Super high. Yeah. I'd call my husband. <laughs> yeah, I definitely did. <laughs> no, this needs a workup of, uh, obviously, of a, yeah. uh, of a, of a liver, uh, of hepatitis. Yeah. Do you what are your concerns for this? What are, what's the thought that, uh, why this is happening in her? Yeah, so, I mean, basically what we were concerned about was an autoimmune hepatitis, um, given that she already had very low drug levels. Um, so she had all these testing done, also ruled out for acute hepatitis, as well as any other viral etiologies. And um, clearly, you know, she had anti-smooth muscle antibody positive. Liver biopsy was suggestive of a more autoimmune uh, situation with moderate interface and lobular hepatitis, with minimal um, portal-based fibrosis. Uh, so what would you do next? She got a prednisone taper. Immediately she felt much better after that, but what would you like to do after this audience response? So I, d I just want to, while everyone's answering, we'll, we um, are an area that is kind of endemic for histo, and sometimes we'll see histo do this where they get joint pain and liver enzymes go up, really? so that would be something okay. to check for. Okay. The other thing sometimes is that just, uh, oh, okay. In okay. So, um, Right, so she basically has this reaction, and uh, she's had a prednisone taper, and so the majority of you would switch mechanisms to vedolizumab. Okay, interesting. So, um, prednisone taper was uh, administered, and she was only taking Lialda for a couple weeks to get her liver enzymes to come down, and she's doing fine all along. So, uh, we check her levels, and sure enough, you know, she has some antibodies there present. So, uh, Dr. Bray, what would you do with her therapy now? Um, so she has, this is all very recent, so she hasn't even received three doses yet of, uh, of her um, uh, infliximab, and, mm. and she's, um, she's feeling well, but mm. she presented quite sick. Mm -hmm. How would you treat her from this point on? So she, did, so the liver enzymes completely normalized? They normalized after you... about six weeks. They, after the prednisone taper completely melted away. Oh, okay, okay, they okay. They normalized. All right, but we're not going to do that again, right? Uh, no. We're not going to give her infliximab again. Well, so yeah. <laughs> I think that that wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, I mean, um, in this, this might be an autoimmune hepatitis. Again, I, I'm not allowed to know too much about liver disease because my husband's a hepatologist. But, uh, but sometimes people develop some idiosyncratic hepatitis from, from the anti-TNFs, and that is not a class effect. That is an effect of a drug. Mm -hmm. So, in, you know, it's the one example where, you know, whereas psoriasis, things like that, you know, it's kind of a class effect. If they develop a hepatitis from adalimumab, it, ne it won't necessarily happen with infliximab. Now, if it's autoimmune, I think maybe that's a little bit of a different thing. So I think Veto is kind of a monosynaptic, mm -hmm. uh, a monosynaptic choice, I think. Okay. So um, basically, her symptoms remained quiet. She's at week 20. She's incredibly worried about flaring again. She was switched over actually to another anti-TNF though. Um, she was switched over to adalimumab okay. and azathioprine. She was okay with combination therapy this time um, with a low dose. And you know she's been in clinical remission for at least three months now. Her liver re enzymes actually remain normal. So that's true. It's, it's unclear whether or not you can go on to another anti-TNF agent after auto, uh, possible autoimmune hepatitis. There are some case reports that it is okay to con consider that, but it's still, you know, it's a very rare occurrence. Um, so for this patient, uh, she's doing fine. What would you do next with management, Dr. Schwartz? Um, I would just, I'd probably check a drug level after she's been on it for a little bit and make sure we're optimized and continue combination therapy. Okay, great. So, um, and then would you check thiopurine metabolites? Um, um, this may be heresy here, but I, I generally don't um, because um, if she's doing well, I usually will follow the MCV. If the MCV's gone up by, you know, seven, nine points, then I'm, I usually, it's equivocal to therapeutic 6TG, so I, I don't usually check it. Really? Yeah. You're kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it doesn't get paid for, so it's, um, I, I only check it when I, I feel like we need that information. Even if you sent it to Quest and LabCorp? It's 250 versus, four, four, you know, it's still a lot of money that's not, not covered. And then, uh, Dr. Hamas, would you check adalimumab levels during maintenance, and uh, where would you want those levels to be for this patient? Well, obviously, we just learned that uh, checking them even on maintenance uh, on, in long intervals makes sense. Mm -hmm. I would be happy with everything, you know, above 
six, I have to say. Okay. Uh, so not too low. And I would definitely check the uh, 6 TGen uh, okay. levels in her, yeah. Okay, so she did have the 6 TG checked, and it was at 139, and um, her serum adalimumab level was at 7.7. .7. Dr. Bray, are you okay with this range? Or would yeah, you make any changes? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, um, we had a, a paper describing that 6 TGN levels, like above 125, were associated with that, that effect of increasing the levels of the anti-TNF. So if that's what you want out of it, that this is fine. It's particularly fine if someone is in remission or coasting. Do you know what I mean? I think it's probably not fine if you're asking it to do some heavy lifting, if you're asking it to have some efficacy. Mm -hmm. yeah, and Jen, maybe, maybe in addition to the monitoring scheduling, the therapeutic monitoring, I think the CalPro should be probably be assessed mm -hmm. as well because that sounds like a gives you a little idea. bit of an answer. Now, would you uh, change her uh, adalimumab dosing schedule or would you leave it there? Um, Maintenance, you know, 10 is what I, you know, we've been hearing. Would you, would you increase that or leave it as is? You're looking at me? Um, uh, <laughs> Dr. Bray. I think if she's fine, I, th I think if she she's really fine. is fine. Okay. Um, I wouldn't, in this case, where it becomes a little trickier is, it, now it's six months later. And you, maybe, oh, are we going to go to six months, months later? Three, yeah, she's about we, there, huh? Okay, because I don't want to, I, no. I didn't memorize That's the okay. slides. <laughs> um, then I don't think you have a lot of wiggle room to stop the thiopurine. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you can as assume that there's going to be a drift downward of the of the of the <coughs> adalimumab levels, and I want I'd want to have a more of a buffer. Do you, do you, this is fine for now, but I'd want to have more of a cushion. That's but over time, it might kind of drift upward mm -hmm. as That's true. as it's consumed less. Yeah. So we did, uh, she did go to weekly though at this okay. time. Oh, okay. So she did go up a little bit. So her, uh, just because of the same concern, she's thinking ahead about possibly de-escalating in the future, but she went up to just weekly for now. 13.4 uh, was her level after going to weekly. So, mm -hmm. you know, now she's at, uh, she has a, a flexig also that shows that she has no activity. She's doing, she has mucosal healed. So this is where um, I'm gonna have Dr. Hamas give us a little bit of um, information on how he would counsel her on de-escalation. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so, in general, I would say that, um, just going back to the previous slide, Jen, I think just upping her dose to weekly based upon just levels, I don't think I would be comfortable with that at this stage of evidence that we have around, especially if you see mucosal healing. I think for me, like the CalPro or even a repeat flag sig with biopsies would be the way to go before I would escalate her to weekly but that's just my 10 cents. So I'll step a little bit on the gas uh, today. Uh, I think three pivotal things in de So de-escalation, where's the evidence? There's not a lot of evidence, but uh, as Maria calls them, the European mafia published a pretty okay paper, statement paper uh, that is in the reference in your book uh, on de-escalation. I'm gonna take you through those. Those are kind of the major bullets, so we don't discuss individual evidence, uh, but you can find that in the paper. But before you even discuss de-escalations, be aware that most patients de-escalate themselves. They just don't tell you. It's called uh, inadherence, okay? Uh, and that's about 30 to 50 percent on, for instance, uh, thyropurin therapy and uh, mesalamine therapy. So be aware of those, those numbers. But invite them in, uh, basically state that, you know, before we do anything, we need to uh, look back at, you know, where are you currently? Is the fire out, as Marie would say? And also be, from, from day one, be really trustful. So say, you know, we're going to make this decision, or, uh, the two of us will make it, or your, your husband or your, your spouse, but it's, it's going to be us in, instead of just a doctor, and, and David had a good slide on that too. And don't ever start to de-escalate without, you know, really uh, agreeing on the monitoring schedule. Because monitoring, how, how else we, are you going to see the iceberg under the, under the, under the, the water uh, level? All right? So real quick, there are three big categories that I like to discuss that patients come to you and say, hey, I want to get off drug. That's the mesalamines, that's the immune modulators, or that's the biologics, correct? So let's do mesalamines. We don't use mesalamines in Crohn's, remember that. In ulcerative colitis, uh, maintenance therapy, just don't stop, all right? Do your renal uh, function tests every year, just once yearly, 
And uh, even we had some cases of really elderly people that have been on this drug for, for more than decades. And you would say, well, the immune system is, is getting old as well, is, get, is getting, you know, in retirement. Uh, you stop your mesalamine and they get the most horrible flares. So it's a safe maintenance therapy. I just tell them that it's just an aspirin and uh, just continue that. The, uh, so we talked a little bit about that. Um, so with high adherence to the drugs, with uh, obviously uh, mucosal healing or really a deep remission, as we say, we can lower the dose for sure. And look at the Cochrane evidence actually there to a maintenance dose of at least two grams per day. All right, at least two. So if they're on uh, four Lialda or something like that, you can reduce it. But, you know, t keep attention to those uh, points. And uh, especially if they had a nasty disease history, like this lady that we're discussing today, you know, you might think twice before stopping your therapy. With immune modulators, even less evidence, I would say. Uh, but we do know that the risk of relapse uh, when they're withdrawn of immune modulators in both uh, forms of IBD is pretty significant. 30% uh, in patients at year two and 50 to 75% at year five. So those numbers really, you know, should convince folks uh, to reconsider whether or not to de-escalate. Um, again, um, you know, the risk benefit of long-term immune uh, therapy in IBD patients, if there is no evidence of continuous disease, you know, uh, you, you can actually consider it. But again, look for mucosal healing, look at factors that really uh, uh, signify long, you know, a, a good outlook, predict a good outlook. And uh, furthermore, as we said, uh, following withdrawal, uh, look for elevated markers of subclinical disease activity. Look for fecal calpro or do a scope uh, at least every year to uh, confirm mucosal healing. So you can find this in your binder. Those are risks for relapse following the withdrawal of immune suppressives. I uh, won't go through all of them, but you know those are kind of came out of various types of studies that actually put folks at a higher risk of relapse. So be aware of that. Or, or discuss that with your patient. When it's combined with uh, a biologic, so when it's maintenance therapy, um, and here uh, point one states that the rate of relapse following the withdrawal of immune suppressives in Crohn's uh, for more than six months is probably not greater than with continued combination therapy. Uh, and so, in other words, that if you want to de-escalate during combination, you better, and, and I think the story, uh, um, study showed that you better de-escalate off an immune suppressive and not a biologic. Higher trough levels at withdrawal are associated with lower rates of relapse following that discontinuation. So you even want to do a trough level before you de-escalate them of your immune suppressives. And in patients, um, yeah, with, with a, you know, uh, a, a very high risk history or a complicated disease course, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. You would see those numbers like 30 or 50 percent in three to five years of relapsing. So I, I wouldn't even try to go there. With a biologic, similar numbers are seen if you really uh, de-escalate them off of an anti-TNF. This is 30 to 40 percent at year one and more than 50 percent be, beyond uh, two years. And the clinical benefits of withdrawal up to this date, and we've learned a lot from our registries and our, a lot of uh, real-world experience studies, are, are theoretical. We, haven't, we don't have any, any data why it would be beneficial to, de, to de, uh, discontinue an anti-TNF. And this should only be considered in folks that really are in long-standing, I would say three, four, maybe even longer years of good, stable clinical, but also deep remission, so including uh, endoscopic remission. Um, yeah, and, and if you had a previous need for uh, dose escalation, like perhaps our patient would have, you're at a high risk of relapse following discontinuation. So it's not a good idea, all right? If it took you a lot of work to get them where they are now, it's, it doesn't make sense to de-escalate. All right. Um, 
And maintenance, yeah. Obviously, you need to have some, if you want to uh, take them off a biologic, then obviously maintain your immune suppressives and do your therapeutic drug monitoring. Again, in your binder, you'll find all these factors associated with the risk following a biologic withdrawal. Um, the dose de-escalation seems to have little impact on disease remission, uh, provided you check your trough levels, that makes sense. Uh, a state of deep remission, uh, decreased reason, I think we talked about that, we covered that. Uh, if you had previous need of previous dose escalations, uh, you know, you have a higher rate of relapse if you want to discontinue your biologic. And obviously, you know, patients with advanced Crohn's disease, with, with uh, penetrating Crohn's disease, fistulas, etc. Uh, again, I would reconsider or actually consider not uh, de-escalate them uh, at all. So with that, Jen. Coming to the conclusion of this uh, particular case, so she s decides to stay for now on the uh, adalimumab weekly and the 50 milligrams uh, once a day. But um, at some point in a year, would you consider what would you de-escalate at that point if she comes to you again, Dr. Schwartz? Well, normally, I, I think in that situation, I would um, think about stopping the azathioprine. I, I don't know in her, given the possible autoimmune hepatitis, that that's going to be possible. But I would try to move towards monotherapy if, if that wasn't uh, complicating the presentation. Mm -hmm. And um, how frequently, Dr. Hummus, would you follow up with her after? After if I de-escalate? Mm -hmm. Well, again, I would uh, need to have agreed with her on the monitoring schedule. You know, how frequently are we going to look for, for fires? And typically, I, I do use fecal kelp pro a lot yeah. in folks that do it, because okay. a lot of folks just don't want to scoop their poop. Mm -hmm. But in folks that do it, uh, I typically, in year one, after mm -hmm. de-escalation, are pretty intense, like three, four times per year, okay. and mm -hmm. then de-escalate that frequency in the years thereafter. Great. And then for health maintenance, uh, what are your health maintenance discussions, Dr. Abreu, for, uh, for her now? She's uh, now out of that hot period, and this is the time to yeah. introduce health maintenance topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I guess, you know, yearly quantiferon is the deal for most insurance companies mm -hmm. anyway, even though I think between us, it's uh, um, a very low risk in the United States to have a newly acquired, uh, newly acquired TB, but that's neither here nor there. It's a check. It's a checkbox. Um, I think that uh, you know the usual suspects. You know, dermatology. She's on both. She's living in you know in South uh, in Southern California, and is sun exposed, etc. Um, uh, you know, flu shots every year, it's pneumonia every however many years. Mm -hmm. um, I think for this kind of stuff, there are really good um, checklists, like uh, Cornerstones has a checklist, the um, Echo um, has a good uh, chest checklist. I'm looking at everything European, I look at you. <laughs> so that you don't have to like use up a lot of neurons to keep that information at your <laughs> fingertips. Great. Okay, so some take-home points for these uh, for these cases. So discuss global, uh, goal of mucosal healing with patients and work that work to achieve that goal as soon as possible. Um, and then risk factors for loss of response with bi biologic therapy include low albumin, high CRP. Uh, factor in these risk factors when deciding on dosing and discussing combination therapy with your patients. And then anti-TNF-related adverse events could be related to low drug levels. Um, and careful, informed discussion about risks of de-escalation are warranted with patients with a good follow-up plan afterwards.